All right, guys. We're going to be looking at a IPTA data range example, and we're going to be focusing on the Australian dollar. Now, if you've noticed, we've had a little bit of a run-up on Aussie, and we're going to break this down a little bit in context why I was expecting the, the levels that we're looking at now to be hit looking at the charts that we share on the forum. So if you're not paying attention to those charts or if you're not saving them, um, it might be a good idea while we're doing this month, not that I'm encouraging you to do this throughout the mentorship, but when we do um, daily reviews, I'm taking you basically to the points at which I'm drawing my attention to on my own journal, how I have reference points on my own charts, what you see me, me noting on those daily entries on the forum, they're the points at which I'm keeping focus in my own journal and any salient points that would be um, in addition to those levels I will make in terms of commentary. But the the month of January when we do these daily entries where I do the dollar index, euro dollar, British pound, US dollar, dollar CAD and Aussie dollar, when I share them with you don't just click on them and wait for some kind of a neon sign and say buy here sell here I want you to be focusing on what I'm drawing your attention to and then watching how price moves to these levels regardless of what type of trader you're going to be you're going to need to be focusing on how that happens from beginning or from foresight to when now we can talk about it in hindsight because all these things are going to help you prepare yourself for when you anticipate something and then wading throughout that process because it's not it's quickly learned by simply looking at a hindsight example where I can say hey, okay this is what we said the market was going to do this is where we thought the market was going to um, happen and here it is bang when you see it in the charts and draw your attention is drawn to it beforehand there's a submission to time that's required and unfortunately we gloss over that many times, even as educators like myself, uh, it, it's hard to communicate what's required in terms of having to wait for that thing to unfold or develop in the chart. Just simply because we have a level or an order block or a target even for price to get to, it, it, when you show a hindsight example, it, that part of the lesson, which in, in my opinion is the that's the main that's the main point you have to learn you have to learn to wait for these things to un unfold the impatience that the market presents us an opportunity experience is overwhelming sometimes and while I'm many times accredited for being very patient I am not really a patient person at all I'm very impatient uh, that's the reason why I don't do long-term position trading but I'm going to counsel you to go in every single day when we do our daily entries for the content, whether it be a video uh, review or whether it be a, a, a teaching or if it's something along the lines of just simply providing the charts, you want to be really copying those charts, printing them out. Make, you know, hold, me, hold me to the standard of if I know what I'm doing, then it should be evidenced in this. Okay? For, you know, for the most part, we've seen many times that occurring, but for your learning, you need to say, okay, this is when this was noted. This is when the observation was made. So how long did it take for this to occur? Now, since January is focused primarily on the daily chart, obviously each daily candle, when it paints and closes for the day, it obviously takes 24 hours to do that. So yes, we can glibly say it takes 24 hours for this candle to form. And this is what it takes in terms of uh, the setup or level being reached over this period of time. It could, took three days or four days or two weeks. You need to experience that. You need to be being mindful of how long those things take, especially on these higher time frame charts. If you don't do this and you're new or you're just a, a relatively uh, inexperienced trader, some of you that are in my group that have been trading for a long time know exactly what I'm referring to. There, There's a big gap in between learning something with examples and hindsight and textbook and even being taught something in a webinar or uh, a workshop live where people say this is what happened in the marketplace. It's missing that element of having to endure what needs to be waited upon to come into your chart. You can't just simply say, okay, well, this is the outcome I'm expecting and therefore I, you know, it needs to happen on my time. That's the part that kills traders. It was very 
um, influential in my early days as a trader because I I needed it to happen right away because when I first started trading, things were moving quick. There were fast markets. And then when I realized that it wasn't like that always, it was a very big struggling point for me. So just go in every day, gather those charts up, print them out, keep a running log of them. In fact, it's probably a good idea just to print them out every day and just get yourself a three-ring binder, punch some holes in it, date them, okay, and then keep track. It's a good reference point to go back on, on Saturdays and Sundays on the weekend when we're not really doing anything. Go back and look at what was observed before the fact and then how long it took for these things to develop and those levels to be reached and what was the response after it got to those levels. Okay, so it's important you go through the mentorship with that in mind. I'm not just showing you trophies or, you know, just things in passing. I'm really trying to draw your attention to something that I want you to focus on and study how long it takes for these things to, to come to fruition. Okay, so get it, let's get into the Australian dollar example for the IFTA data range. All right, so we have here a futures chart. Okay, this is the March contract. The underlying daily chart of the futures contract of the Australian dollar. And by looking at the futures contract, if we're going to be trading Forex, okay, it's, and it's really important that you know that you can get a lot of insight just by studying the underlying futures uh, price. So since if we're going to be looking at the Australian USD pair, as our case study, we're going to be looking at how influential the study of just the futures contract alone, how that's paramount in understanding how that moves right into and segues beautifully into trading in the foreign exchange market. If I were to do a poll right now, and if we were all in the same room together, okay, and we simply said, hey, look, um, I've never traded Forex or I've never traded uh, futures, if you were studying one or the other, I guarantee you a large percent of you, probably 80% or more, never really refer to the opposite in terms of the analysis. So what I mean by that is if you're a futures trader, you've never considered what the foreign exchange market's doing. Or if you're a, a futures trader, I'm sorry, a forex trader, and you've never considered what the underlying futures contract is doing, vice versa. It's imperative that you understand what they're both doing. To get a complete picture, you want to be looking at both. Now, obviously, right away, one's going to assume, well, it should be the obvious. It, it should be the same thing because the Australian is leading the pair, Aussie versus the dollar. So, therefore, the Australian underlying futures contract should be, in fact, the same thing we see in the foreign exchange market. And by far and large, it, that's true. But there are certain data points that you cannot get by looking at the foreign exchange market. There's simply no way of getting that because foreign exchange doesn't give you volume. It doesn't give you accurate volume like you can get volume from the underlying futures contract. And we're going to talk more about that as we go. But I want you to take a look at this chart here, okay? And I'm looking at a little bit less than six months. I wanted to show just this data range because outside of this, the chart becomes spotty because it is a futures contract and it's March delivery. So that means uh, prior to March, we had December's contract and that's already uh, – expired and now we're trading in the nearby contract which is March 2017 Australian dollar. When we taught or rather when I taught the IPTA data ranges, okay, uh, obviously I, I asked everyone to hold off sending me emails but some of you were just overzealous and want to know it right now and these are things that we're going to be building on your understanding as we go through the mentorship especially through January. But I want you to focus, when you look at your daily chart, just simply go through and look at the last three months, okay, start whatever, whatever time point you're looking at. Like right now, let's assume we sat down with the charts right now, and this would be the first day we're looking at Australian dollar. We're a brand new trader, brand new to the concept. We're sitting down. How would we, how would we go about looking at where the IPTO data ranges are? And if we're looking at Australian dollar, you want to go from today's, uh, candle, which is what's being painted here, that, and it's not a candle, I know it's open, high, low, close, but you're going to have to suffer through that, <laughs> okay, because I'm, uh, I had to get these slides together, and uh, I promise there will be candlesticks shown, but for now, I want you to focus on this, because the open, high, low, and close is important. The most recent market shift, okay, in the last three months occurred back in November, 
Now, I know some of you that are hardline critics are saying, well, here we go again. This is a hindsight thing. This is where hindsight is gold. You need to know what I'm going to show you in this teaching because it will clarify what the IPTA data ranges are actually supposed to be doing for you. Some of you are thinking that it's going to call the high and low 20 days, 40 days, and 60 days away. That's not what happens. Sometimes it can hurt. Sometimes it can occur, but that's not what its job is. Okay. The the question that comes up a lot is when I'm looking for a order block to buy on, or if I'm looking at an order block to sell into, or if I'm looking for an area of buy stops or sell stops, which one should I expect? them to go after? Which one are they going to respect? How do I know if it's not going to keep on going through an old high and not be a turtle soup sell? All those scenarios and those ideas, while I told everyone in the beginning, if you were just patient and waited, and all those questions would be answered. But some of you are just really, really impatient. And I get it. You're excited. And you think that you're not going to learn all this stuff in the remaining time of the mentorship. But trust me, I'm committed. You will learn it. There's tons of information coming to you, but you have to let me go through the process of teaching it. This isn't the first time I taught this stuff. So trust me, I've been successful in the past doing it, okay? So just go along with the process. But if we look at back in November, we can clearly see that there was a major market shift in November 2016. Now, what that does, it gives us a great deal of insight. We can't take a time capsule, travel back in time, okay, and be back in November and go short there. But we can use the information that our daily charts are telling us there. That means there was a great deal of displacement by the large players or smart money. When we see that in November, what we're seeing here is the underlying futures contract of the new Australian dollar has a market shift right there. That's a quarterly market shift. Over the last three to six months, that's the most obvious one. You can clearly see it. If I was to ask everyone if we were all in the same room, raise your hand if you can clearly see that that is the most obvious market shift in the last three to six months. Everybody invariably would raise their hand. They would obviously, if you can see it, you can't deny it. That's what you're looking for. Every three months, there's going to be something like this occurring. It could be a sell-off, creating a high, or it could be a, a low where it starts to rally. But every three months, I want you to look at your charts and anticipate finding that in hindsight. Now, great. That's wonderful. You can see it in hindsight. What do you do with that information? See, this is what I have an issue with, like with Elliott Wave and all these other very, they're just very highly subjective. If the market really is influenced or controlled by smart money, or if there is what I'm telling you, there's an algorithm that controls what price is going to do. It's absolutely not random. It's predetermined. It's, it's running on a script that refers to specific data points that it will go back to over and over and over again. The IPTA data range, okay, you have a 20-day look back and cast forward range. You have a 40-day look back and cast forward range. And then you have a 60-day look back and cast forward range. What I'm suggesting to you is if you are looking at price and you see a, for instance, you have a market structure shift here and the quarterly shift occurs in November, that means that now the market is in a sell profile from that point until it gets to a level of significant counter direction, what would cause it to change direction, or consolidate. That's the other thing. That's the vague green, uh, not green, but gray area in the analysis. Sometimes you won't see a clear retracement or correction, opposite direction. For instance, it's been going down November. Uh, it could have very easily been consolidating here going into January, okay, and into, into February. It doesn't need to be a counter trend move like we're seeing unfold here since the last week of December. It can be a consolidation. And as we go further into the content for the January uh, delivery of the information, we'll talk about when it does or when to anticipate when it's going to go into consolidation and not have a, a, a counter swing. So back in November, we see that there's a high made. What's, what's really going on? That low here is broken. So we have a, a shift in market structure and it breaks lower. 
We know that we can see it because it's taken out an area of equal highs and we pierced above that taking out the buy stop liquidity pool and that's seen here. That was the uh, that was the basis and the framework around what caused the market structure shift. That quarterly effect comes in uh, to operation at that moment, okay, where our eyes go immediately back to November because you can clearly see it. When you see that and you delineate that on your chart, what you're doing is, is you're now identifying the beginning of November. So you have to have a basis point. Where Where is it? Where did it all begin? Because if you don't get yourself in sync with what IPTA most recently did, and IPTA is the Interbank Price Delivery Algorithm, that's for your notes again, you're going to delineate where the most obvious one in the last three months has been. Then you're going to cast out 20 days go forward from the beginning of the, the month that that market structure shift or quarterly shift takes place. You're going to count out 20 days. Now, it may not even be 20 days. You may look at the chart and say, hey, this is an obvious one right here. Something's really going on. If you do that, you're really doing too much anticipation. you got to go back to the most obvious one, and it may require you going back three months. But find the most recent one where the market structure has shifted, and there was a move that took place that was obvious, bullish or bearish. Okay, And it's really easy if you just divide your, your daily chart into – uh, quarters, like put one, put a line on March, put a line on uh, June and September, December, and just keep doing that. Your your eye will go right to where these uh, quarterly shifts are happening. They're not going to always occur on those months. There's a little bit of gray area, which is the reason why we have a look back and a cast forward. The IPTA data range, okay, what it's really doing is it's highlighting you as the trader. You're going to try to mimic what this algorithm's doing. It's looking for the liquidity in the range of 60 days in the past. Where is the sell stops in the last 60 days? Where are the buy stops in the last 60 days? Where are the fair value gaps? Where's the price gaps that price has not been efficiently delivered in the last 60 days? Where are the... Um, the liquidity voids where price has only been delivered on the upside where it has to come back down to efficiently deliver price and balance it out by going back down and closing in that range. Optimal trade entries, that's where that comes from. Where are the equilibrium price points? Does it have to return back to equi equilibrium? Did we get too far ahead of ourselves? Did we extend too far? Do we have to come back and retrace minor retracement before we see the next leg lower? By looking at the market structure shift that takes place in this November time period, we are in essence saying that this is a quarterly shift. Therefore, because it's a daily chart, this is going to give us insight about what the market should do on a three-month timeline, as much as six months. But I like to just remind you that I'm only really looking for about three months horizon, time horizon, that far out. I don't like to look beyond that. There's been many times I can show you in journals where I had it right, but I really, just because I had it right doesn't mean I was executing on every trade. But many times I'm really accurate in about four to six weeks time horizon, and it's about the half-life of a three-month cycle. So if I think that the time horizon is um, consistently derived at by looking at three months out by using the daily chart like this, that's my belief. I, I'm firm in my belief that I believe I can teach you how to do that and have a three-month horizon. By having that, that is a great deal of opportunities for all disciplines of trading, long-term position, swing, short-term, intraday, scalping, all that stuff can be done effectively by having this time horizon. But when we find the clear market structure shift that happens every quarterly, every three to four months or so, we find it. We identified the beginning of that month. you got to roll back to that first month. Why are we doing that? Why does it have to go back to the first month? First of the month, rather. Because if an algorithm, and I'm not sure if any of you are aware of uh, how computer programs are made or, or designed, but when a systems analyst um, sits down with a company and they say, okay, look, this is what I want um, the output to be, or I need a, a report generator 
that's, that's going to give me this outcome, or I need this information, or I need this computation made, I need this process done. Okay, the system analysis, system analyst is going to say, okay, what what data points are you making available to me so I can sit down with my team of computer programmers, okay, and the analyst will make a documentation stage where he sits down and outlines the overall macro process. Now, because of what they're dealing with, they are taught and learn computer programming to some degree, but they are not doing the programming. They put all of the context around what is supposed to happen. What processes are there? If this is done, then this should be done as well. What checks and balances? And it's basically the documentation stage of the process of a computer program. Then the computer programmers take that information and they actually code it out. Now, a, com a computer program and a computer programmer is completely, utterly blind and useless if he doesn't have data points to use. You can't have a computer program do anything of any value unless it knows where to draw data points from. There has to be an array of information coming to it to process and do calculations. So my, here's my – this was my epiphany. Okay, When I was sitting down with the folks that were introducing these ideas to me, and no, they're not in the, the teaching circuits. You're never going to meet these people, Okay, but when I was introduced on how the markets actually work and operate, the the fast thing I uh, the fastest and most obvious thing I learned was there was no ambiguity to how price moves around. There was no randomness because they were talking about things that had a finite or origination where it wasn't like it could have been this day, it could have been that year, it could have been this month. No, 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 no. It's absolutely nothing like that. If you understand that we're going to be referring to things that are numerical, they are price-related, they are value-based, that means that we have to look at a specific level in price, but how does the algorithm go just to end the old price? How does the algorithm know that, yet, that that's where the large fund stops are? See, this is what's taught and permeated in the teaching uh, circuits in in education for trading. They teach, and I've said these things before, but I used it to communicate to you the idea because most people don't understand fund level trading. They don't understand institutional trading. They don't they don't know those types of things. They just think I got an account with my broker, so therefore I'm trading and if I get stopped out, it's my broker that did it to me. And many times that's true. But the delivery of price from the central bank level, that movement that repricing is really, not always, but on a short term, it's being repriced to take into account for large liquidity pools that are available on the large fund trading realm, not your little mom and pop FXCM, not your OANDA. You know, none, of those, none of those things okay, are obvious or on the radar screen for what I'm teaching you here, but they are in close uh, – they're, they're basically in alignment with the same thing, okay? But they're not, this, these movements for these runs on stops, they're not looking at, oh, here's Michael's stop, okay? Here's uh, John Jones from uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania's stops, okay? They, they don't have that type of information. They don't see you. They don't have any identification of you. They don't have any identification to retail at all. But because these ideas are taught across the board the same way because it's been – put out there to be done this way because eventually if you're a, if you are a, an accurate trader that's a retail based trader okay eventually if you're profitable to some degree what eventually happens to some of these people they get very high minded of themselves they think then they, they're great at what they're doing so therefore they're profitable and the first thing they want to do is prove it to the world by having everyone else give them their money and they're going to be a trader that manages funds no one wakes up and is born a large fund trader. They come up through the ranks of being a profitable retail trader. So are they going to come into that realm and change the way they've been doing things? Absolutely not. It's the same thing they're going to do there. Then the difference is they have a process on the fund level that they have to go through specific parameters and guidelines and stay within these to be compliant with whoever is running that uh, that operation behind the scenes. In other words, just because you're a large fund manager, unless you're operating alone and, and independent, if you go to work for uh, an agency and you are a fund trader and you're managing under their umbrella, 
then you have guidelines you have to work within. There's there's rules and, and things that you can't do outside of these, or you're you're you know you basically get canned. You're out the door. You're gone. You can't manage anything. They'll you know they'll expel you. But these ideas are the same. So how can an algorithm or a computer? We'll just say it like this: How can a computer program know where everyone's stop is? It has to have a range of data. Now. Just because we have the, the numbers of price, the value of price, okay, they have to have a look-back period. The look-back period is 20 days, 40 days, and 60 days. And what you're doing is, and this is the, what I want you to do with your, your time after today's teaching while you're waiting for today's daily recap video because there will be two that go up. This is the teaching video for today, and then we'll have a daily review where I do like 10, 15 minutes talking about what's already happened. And I'll give you the charts and stuff to study. I want you to spend your time this evening, okay, and even tomorrow while we're not doing any live session. Go back through your charts and don't just look at the Australian dollar. Look at every currency pair. Look at every commodity. Look at individual stocks. Look at indices. And, and you'll see quickly by studying this, it will become quickly clear that there's no randomness to it. There's a specific pattern that this thing does all the time. Now, it used to be a manual thing where the market maker was a real person. They sat there and they worked with a team of individuals that manipulated price to do these very things. But because everything has become so streamlined and efficient by uh, artificial intelligence, AI, the uh, the effectiveness of algorithms, okay, that, that's been implemented now. It's much more efficient to do that. And there's no emotion. It just does what it needs to do. So if the computer program, or I'm quoting with my fingers now, the uh, interbank price delivery algorithm, that computer program, we're going to call it from this point on for this teaching, for it to be effective, it has to know where to look at to find stops. They don't see orders. That's not what's going on. They don't see orders. The orders are executed on by the traders at the bank level. The algorithm just permits the price to move to that level, which gives the opportunity for the traders to execute on that run. That's the real story. That's what really goes on. Everybody else out there in this industry will tell you, well, it's this happening, and this, this guy here, he's, he's pushing a button, and it's doing this to happen. No, it's not. it's not. That's not what's happening at all. The algorithm will look back 60 days, and it'll find – it's very easy. If, if, you, if you know anything about computer programming – and you don't even have to do that, but just look at this 1st of November. If you look back 60 days in the past, what was the highest high in the last 60 days? There's going to be buy stops above that high. What's the lowest low in the last 60 days? There's going to be sell stops below that low. In the last 40 days, what was the last highest high and what was the last lowest low? Looking back in the range to the left from that November red line that we're delineating in November, where are the stops below and above those highs inside of the range of 20 days, 40 days, and 60 days? Now, I already know what some of you are thinking. Well, what happens if there's a low that's really, really obvious that's just outside the range of 60 days? That's the farthest extreme. That's when the open float will move aggressively and go outside that normal parameter of 60 days, and you'll see that big run. The market will jump and skip right down into that old low that's just outside that 60-day range. How do you know when it's going to be an explosive move, Michael, when you have that scenario? If the last 60 days, if they've already ran out the, the, the stops below and low in the last 60 days, or – above an old high in the last 60 days, and there is a larger, higher high or lower low where the stocks will be resting above or below respectively, then, then you know there's going to be a big run on price and they're going to run for that liquidity because that's the only other thing that's left. The large funds have their orders above and below these old highs and lows. You work just like the algorithm will in a 60-day range. Look back the last 60 days. And then you watch going forward. You cast forward 60 days, and you can literally have this on your chart. You go forward, count forward 60 days. You can literally go on your daily chart in MT4 and change your date 60 days forward to make a vertical line. 
And that way, as price starts to paint, you'll know you're approaching that 60-day. That means it's going to be forming some measurable intermediate term high or low before that time. And it's going to create a liquidity pool above an old high or below an old low. That's going to be influential for future trades. The same thing occurs by looking back on the last 40 days to the left of that November 1st. Look back 40 days. What was the lowest low? What was the highest low? I'm sorry. What was the highest high, rather, and the lowest low? Your buy stops above the old high and the sell stops below that old low inside of that range of 40 days. That's where IPTA will look for that liquidity. Now, it's not giving you directional bias yet. I'm telling you it needs to use these reference points to find where the stops would logically be. See, the AI cannot, it can't think for a human. It can't do that. But because human nature says that we will, as traders, put our sell stop below a low, and we will put a buy stop above an old high. That's all the algorithm's doing. It's seeking to take price to that level. When it gets to that level, then your broker, then the central bank can do a wild spike and send it above 10 to 20 pips. Think about it now. 10 to 20 pips. Then it becomes logical why they do those big spikes, okay, intraday, 20 and tw uh, 10 and 20 pips above an old high. Then it stops right, many times right at 20 pips or 10 pips, and then rejects it goes the other way. It first has to get to those levels based on a daily chart in the realm of a 20 pip, 40, I'm sorry, 20 day, 40 day, or 60 day, look back, and then cast forward. So really what you're doing is, is you have 120 days of range from the past and going forward. There's going to be a significant move. Now, you, some of your friends, of course there's going to be a move, Michael. <laughs> Come on. I mean, a lot can happen in 120 days. Yeah, you're right. But there's things that you have to look for that the algorithm is going to be doing to engineer these types of moves. So you have to have these data points to know why the market's going to go at an old low. What old low? Well, where's the lowest low in the last 20 days? Where's the last 40 days? Where's the lowest low in that range? Where's the highest high in that last range? And you need to be noting those because that's the one that they're going to run. They're going to run right for those. If there isn't anything that hasn't been traded to in the last 60 days, if everything's been wiped out above and below the market place, in other words, the open float, all the buy stops above old highs, and all the sell stops below old lows in the last 60 days during your look back, in other words, everything to the left of that November vertical line, that red line, if everything's been cleaned out above and below the highs and lows, there's no more buy stops, there's no more sell stops, it has to create a new expansion. So you have to identify what the next high and low outside that range of 60 days, looking back, where that is. And that's going to tell you where they're going to draw a price on this daily time frame. It's more, it's more confirmed when you start applying it to the weekly chart and the monthly chart because you'll start seeing things align where that old low that's just outside of the last 60 days looking back, there's an old low that may not be on this chart here. I don't know. I'm just giving you a hypothetical uh, example. If there's an old low that's just outside the realm of September in this example here, say maybe there's August, there's a, a significant lower low, the market's going to reach for that. There may be a high that's just outside the September boundary in August. They, they, they may have uh, turned around here, and they make a, a run for that. Maybe it may be in the 78 uh, price range for, uh, for Aussie. That's what you would be noting, and you're going to look for price to be drawn to one of those two price points, and you look for evidences that that institutional order flow is going that direction. Then you know where it's going. It gives you directional bias because of the higher time frame nature of this daily chart and weekly and monthly. So what we have here, this is the, the look forward, okay, or cast forward of November. This is 20 days out from the 1st of November. So we have 20 days here. Inside of that 20-day range, there's going to be a significant setup that you can use for your trading. It's moving up into the old low that was formed in October. It goes into consolidation. Well, here we have a, a condition where the market didn't create any significant shift, but it starts to move in consolidation. Then you count forward. Okay, from here, that's the 20th. So you can go from the beginning of November to the 20th, 
yes, there was a price swing, but using the information, the next stage would be 40 days out from that price point of November beginning. We have here. That is your 40-day lookout or cast forward. And you're looking for, again, a potential major shift quarterly. It can happen at that point. Now, it didn't give you the lowest low because if you go back to the left, two, two daily candles or bars, the last down right here, this down candle, that was the actual low. We had a small little range in here, and then we came down and hit this level here, 71.50. That's the 40 days out from the beginning of November, framed on the quarterly shift that took place here. So we're anticipating a potential change in, in the direction, okay, 20, 40, or 60 days out. But that's the range. It's not always going to do like what you're seeing here, where it's almost calling the very day it moves and makes the, the change. It's a, you're allowing your study to say, okay, the price is going to move about 20 days, and then we could see something. If it doesn't happen in 20 days, okay, well, in the next 20 days, up to 40 days from where the market structure um, last shifted here quarterly, then we're going to anticipate in the realm of the next 20 days, it may happen. So you have to be looking for signs that it's going to happen. If you don't do these things, you're going to marry the idea that the market's going to keep on going lower and never turn around. It doesn't, it doesn't do that. Markets don't trade in straight lines. So if we see here, on this day here, this is 40 days out from the beginning of November. Very significant price move occurred from that price, 71.50. I mean, I would think everyone, if we were all in the same room, if we raised our hand, if we were in agreement, I think the majority of us, if not all of us, would raise our hand and say, that's a pretty significant move off that level. One of the things I learned when I was an indicator-based trader, uh, I liked stochastic, I like uh, uh, Larry Williams' accumulation distribution formula, where it plotted an accumulative line based on the relationship to open to close and close to open, and measuring that as some uh, smart money buying and selling. While sometimes that's true, uh, not always, and it didn't always give you a divergence. Uh, I liked his William Percent R, and the reason why I liked his William Percent R is because it has an uncanny ability to be one day before. Like if you look at stochastic, you have to wait for the, the candle to close and go to a new candle to see if the K line crossed the D line or D line crossed the, uh, the K line or whatever it is. I don't even remember what it is anymore. But the, the trigger line that uses uh, the idea behind a crossover for, stas for stochastic, that has to happen after the fact. Well, the market's already moved. When I looked at the percent R, what that did, it gave me many times the day before the real oversold condition would happen. For instance, if the oversold condition existed in the Williams percent R, Today, that means tomorrow, it's probably still likely to go down just a little bit more, but that's going to be the buy day. That's the very low low. Well, that same phenomenon sometimes occurs with these ranges. 20 days out, you may get, the if it doesn't turn, it may happen on the 21st day, or it may occur on the 19th day when, the, when it does occur. But that's not what you're relying on. So it's important that while that may have magic in your chart sometimes, you may see it happen. It might do the very thing of turning on the 20th day or the 40th day or the 60th day. And you saw that in my first teaching for the month. I wish I probably would have stressed it more because everyone seems to think that that's what's going to happen. I, I'm not telling you that the market turns every 20 days, every 40 days, and every 60 days. But it can and will sometimes do that. What we're looking for is these quarterly shifts that take place. Once we identify one, there's our beginning point, okay? But you have to roll back to the beginning of that month it occurs in. It occurred in the second week of, uh, of the month of November. So we're, now we're calibrated. Now we can start going forward until we see a equal or counterparty uh, to that move going lower. It has to be a significant uh, re you know, retracement or correction or reversal. It's indicating that here, the last week of December. Why is it doing that? Because we've taken out December's high. See that? We're trading at a level where if this was continuously bearish, it shouldn't be where it's at right now today. Okay? But my point in drawing your attention to the 40-day is it was not the 40th uh, – I'm sorry. It wasn't the fact that it made the lowest low 
and turned on that day. But look at the low in proximity to the lowest low that was formed here inside. Just see this day here was inside the range of 40 days back to this price point here. So from this level of looking at the first day of November, casting forward 40 days, this whole turning point right here could have happened any time in the last 40 days. Now, again, for some of those that are cynical, of course, obviously, this, this is of no value. It's a great deal of value because inside that 40 days, just like when we look back for 40 days and look for the low for sell stops and we look for the high for the buy stops, in this range here, what is this? That's a low. Below that low is going to be what? Sell stops. Yes, we moved a, a, about 150 pips or so below that, but we came to a level of 7150. That's not random. 7150 is a significant level. It's a mid-figure level, and it's happening at a time when inside of 40 days, the IPTA data range is going to be looking to do something. It has, to, it has to do something. Every three months, price is going to be pushed around. It's going to be drawn to a level or it's going to repel from a level. And it's based on what I'm telling you here. It's seeking large fund liquidity. Now, longer term, where we're talking about monthly and yearly moves, they are all driven by real fundamental things like interest rates. But every quarter, there's going to be a ebb and flow that takes place, a rally and a decline. When this occurs, that's all short-term in nature. When you look at long-term trends that go for five years or ten years, three months is nothing. That's like a five-minute chart on the scheme of a weekly chart. It doesn't mean anything. There's no significance to it at all. Long-term macro fundamentals okay, are not impacted by three-month cycles. They're not. They can be used to get in sync with long-term macro fundamentals, but the only fundamentals you're going to get from me is interest rates, which is going to be taught to you this month as well. So again, in summary, the 40 days, and I'm not done teaching, but for 40 days, this range, we're looking back, because see now here we have a new 40-day look, we're casting forward 40 days, so that at that moment, we're going to have that in our charts. From this point here, we know 40 days from then, this is where we would have our expectation of a shift. But we also, because we can do that in advance, we can now look back 20 days from there. We can look 40 days back from there. Where's the lows and where's the highs? Think about that. If we know at this point here, casting 40 days forward, we can have a vertical line right here on our, or on our charts. Now, to someone looking over your shoulder, they'd be like, why is that line even there? Why do you have a vertical line there? I don't know. I ain't telling you. You weren't part of the mentorship. <laughs> but from this point here, counting back, let's do it. Here's, here's, you got to count this day as day one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay. So twenty is basically the the last day before you get to December. So the second to the last day in November is twenty days back. What was the highest high formed in that range? It's going to be mid-December, uh, mid where it made those equal highs. So there's going to be what, what's resting above that? Buy stops. So what is the IPTA algorithm going to do? It's going to seek that liquidity. It's going to go up there and take that. Which high should I look for, Michael? That one. Looking back from this point here. Because we know it from this point here, casting forward 40 days, okay? Going back 40 days, well, that's going to be in the range that's delineated here with this line that we've already shown. This is the low. Is there any significance about that low? Well, I'll counsel you to go into your 4-hour, 1-hour, and 15-minute time frame and put up 7300 on your Aussie dollar and see what you see. There's nothing random about this stuff, folks. That low is 40 days inside the 40-day range. Okay, that is a significant turning point. It's not the very lowest low, but you can see that the low forms two days before that. And then we have a market structure shift, and the market starts to go opposite to what has been put in place in November. 
You can now also, from that price point there, by having a vertical line on the arrowed uh, daily range, you can now start counting forward 20 days, 40 days, 60 days, until you see an obvious shift quarterly. There is a major structure shift, okay? It could be bullish or bearish. Whatever one it happens, it doesn't make it. You're not trying to forecast that. All you're doing is anticipating another significant move in price on a daily chart, and it happens every three months. But the point is the the IPTA data ranges give you a means of looking back 20, 40, and 60 days from specific days and specific price points. Because then you'll know what stops they're going to be reaching for above an old high and below an old low. It's not just, well, I'm looking for the most recent obvious high and low. No, 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 no. It's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. you got to look back in a range of 20, 40, and 60. And then if all those levels have been cleared out, then you got to look outside that range. Then you know you're getting ready to see a big move. And if it has these characteristics, then you know you're going to see a larger move, higher or lower, based on what those uh, highs and lows would be outside the most recent 60-day look back. All right, so this is the Australian dollar candlestick. You can uh, rest your eyes a little bit, and the more strain in your eyes on the open, high, low, and close bar. Here's that 70-50 level, okay, and why that's significant. Here we have a old low back in... February of 2016, we have the last down candle, but that last down candle has a range in it. Okay, let me show you again. This is what it looks like, that wick right in here, right here. Look at that price movement up right before the last, well, it's the last week of February, the big green candle right there. We know that prior to that, we saw the down close and that explosive range higher that high is going to be significant. It's going to be sensitive, okay? But all the way down into the opening of that weekly range. Also, notice that this last down candle here, right before this big move up in the last week of May of 2016, that last red candle, that was the bullish order block as well. So we have a big range to work within. Then going into the latter portions of 2016, the Last down candle in December, that would be a bullish order block as well. Looking at the the high and the open on that candle would give you significant price points to go forward as well. But look what happens when price hits the 7150 level. It's been down here before, and they repelled aggressively away from that. Fundamentally, must be something to it. I don't know what it is, but on a weekly chart, we're going to be using old highs and old lows. And if those old highs and old lows had significant buying and selling pressures, it's evidence, and you can see it here, we have to be mindful of that. And you can see that they have, in fact, traded down there. We tapped it two times on a weekly basis and then moved out. Once we moved out away from that level, you can see that they're going to be looking to do what? They're going to be trading above these candles' bodies, and the wicks are next. And we could potentially trade up into this last up candle in the last week of October of 2016. That's where the bearish order block is. So we have a range that potentially could take us up into 75.70 to 75.80 still for Australian dollar. Let's go back into the daily on Australian dollar. And I want you to take a look at this chart for a moment. Stare at this for a second. Tell me what you see. Okay, this is, again, this is the March contract for the Australian futures market. It's going to basically do the same thing our Australian dollar pair does in Forex. But what you're seeing here cannot be seen in trading Forex. And all these guys that get on Facebook and on the Internet and Twitter, and they know everything about Forex, and they know the insides and, the, and everything that, that's secret, okay, the buzzword smart money. And now that's institutional trading. Everything is uh, making its way in everybody else's curriculum now. But none of them talk about this, okay? And this is where I learned the things that Larry Williams taught in his book, How I Made a Million Dollars Trading Commodities Last Year. He wrote that book in the 70s, folks. You know, we're in 2017 now. 
very, very few things have the longevity of what has been taught in his book. I mean, for less than it costs for a pair of shoes today, you literally can buy a book that if you have no understanding about how commodities move and how they're priced and all that business, uh, to me, I think that is an essential part of every trader's library. Again, the title is How I Made a Million Dollars Trading Commodities Last Year by Larry Williams. In his book, he talks about how he was taught, he didn't discover it, he was taught this by his friend, and I think if I'm not mistaken, I think he names his friend in that book, but the, uh, if not, you can find it on YouTube, you do a search on Larry Williams and Open Interest. But the, the fact that Open Interest is the most misunderstood data point in trading is a wonderful opportunity for you as a trader. If there is, now think, think just for a second. If there is 100% control over price, there has to be someone controlling it. We're going to globally call that smart money. If they are controlling it, why would they want to control it? Greed. They want to make money just like anybody else does. Banks are not in the business to go out of business. They're in business to buy and sell money or provide means for you to borrow money to pay them interest on the usage of that money. That's just one facet of it. There's also speculation. That is the mis most misunderstood realm because it's not widely talked about. You have to be in that arena. You have to be there to know anything about it, and you are forced to not talk about anything. So I had to create a language, if you will, okay, to be able to talk where – the things I understood are effectively communicated, but also doesn't put me out there where I'm in trouble. That's why we are in this teaching, uh, this, this medium. The things that I quickly learned that were apparent in the marketplace is that, yes, there is an entity out there that is 100% interested in offsetting large funds because they have – real huge orders in the marketplace, and if they can upset them or take them out of the marketplace, they know that their viewpoint will eventually get back in line because they're trend following in nature. They can take them out of the move and then take their seat in that position, or they can take them in the wrong side of the move and then reprice aggressively the other way, and they can profit from that. They're not looking at OANDA or FXCM's books and saying, okay, well, you know, we're going to really punish retail today. Retail is just following the, you know, the blind leader of all these textbooks. All that stuff you know, that, that leads you to losses, that's a, a derivative of you doing what you've been told to do, and it doesn't have any basis in how the markets actually work. Once in a while, they will work, so, you know, but you're not, it's not because of that. It didn't happen because of the divergence in stochastic. It didn't happen because your wolf wave or your harmonic crab riding on the back of an eagle's wings pattern. It doesn't have, that doesn't happen. Okay? Price is moving based on where the large funds orders are. Where that open float is on these higher time frame charts, that's what's drawing price. But because the price is going to allow the bank level traders to get in and build positions in, otherwise, if it was really just uh, the central bank's repricing, it would be like all the time big moves, moving up to an old high, then down to an old low, the traders have to have an opportunity to work inside that position to capitalize on the move that IPTA is engineering for them. How do we know when the banks, smart money, are actually going in and buying? If we know that there's a likelihood that 7150 on Aussie dollar is potentially bullish, what evidence is there that there is, in fact, smart money buying it? Well, inside that blue shaded area in here, I have a great deal of insight to share with you. And some of you already know some about something about this, but I want you to think about this. Every three months, this occurs. Write this down in your notepad. If you're busy changing diapers, okay, doing dishes, hiding from your boss, write this down. Every three months, this pattern occurs. Where you're at a support level, a major higher time frame support level, if you see an expectation that price should be bullish, 
we have been trading lower and we hit the level like we're seeing here at 71.50 as we just let me go back one more time to show you the weekly chart there's that 71.50 level down here we've been there before in May okay so look at that level here you can see that 7150 that level has been hit perfectly it has nails it okay and then it runs away as price hit it as price hit this level here this purple line in here I want you to look at what was going on as price was dropping down okay all through this market structure shift in November okay what's happening here Yes, price is repricing going lower. It's allowing bank level traders to be short and capitalize on that move. But also, open interest is also declining. Why, are, why is that happening? Why is open interest declining when this move's dropping down? What, what significance is that? Because if you read Larry Williams' book, he says his buddy told him if the market is in consolidation all through here, all between 77 and 74.50 for August, September, and October, price was in a big trading range. It's in consolidation. Then in November, it creates a false breakout above 77 big figure and rejects and trades lower. Open interest is taught that as long as a trend is going up or down and you see open interest increasing as the trend goes, that's a healthy trend. That works for bull markets doesn't work for down markets that's a misnomer that's misinformation Larry Williams says when open interest drops while you're in consolidation we're in consolidation all through August September and October price drops down in here we have a big drop in open interest open interest is the total open longs and shorts that are in the marketplace right now if the central bank is the storehouse for price it's their currency. It's their commodity. If you are trying to buy currency, it has to be made available to you. And it's going to come from a bank. If this would have been gold, okay, uh, the commodity is gold. Is There's a, a provider or a liquidity provider of gold. Okay, you have to buy up this position or assume a position in gold. Well, for Australian dollar, if you're buying that currency, it has to come from somewhere. It comes from the bank. So if they are the liquidity provider for the price of Australian dollar, the Central Bank of Australia, if that bank is providing you the basis of the valuation on Australian dollars, they are essentially doing what? They're the counterparty to all the large funds. Not always, not 100%, because you have all kinds of smaller entities and institutions that could take the other side of other positions. But for, for the most part, View open interest as every trade that the central bank is providing counterparty to. Basically what a small brokerage firm would do with their own clients, they are the liquidity provider. Well, the central bank is the liquidity provider for Australian dollar. So if we see open interest increasing, what does that mean? That means the central bank is uh, it's taking on risk. It's providing liquidity for buyers of Australian dollar. If open interest has a 15% or more drop or change lower, like it does here, this is, a, this is a very significant drop. While price is sideways, this is bullish because what this is doing is every, every time open interest increases, it's indicating that they have now provided liquidity for a buyer. If they're not trying to provide liquidity for a buyer and they're trying to reduce their holding or exposure, that means that they're not doing what? To offer liquidity to a buyer, they have to be a seller. Open interest reflects the selling side of a provider of liquidity. If this open interest declines aggressively like this, that's indicating they do not want to hold the heavy short position they would be having by being a provider for those that want to buy Australian dollar. You see it rally then. But look carefully. The extended trading range is months long. What's going on that whole time? From this point here, they start building in positions. They're selling this thing as it's creating higher highs. It's coming back. It's, they're selling more of it here, and they're selling more of it here. 
every peak in the open interest from the low it creates here, every peak in it is a high. They sold more here. They sold more here, right at this high. They sold the most right there. They're selling into that rally. You don't get that from Larry Williams' book. You do get him saying open interest increases. We're in, we're in bearish markets, and if we're in a consolidation, it tells you if we see open interest increasing in a consolidation, that means that the open interest is reflecting heavy net selling on the central bank level. That's how I'm viewing it for currency trading. But what he taught in his book was the commercial traders, the large commercial uh, users or producers of a commodity, they're actually building in heavy short positions. What I learned was by looking at open interest and matching up the highs to the peaks in open interest, you can actually see where they did their sell programs. That's a sell. They're selling it here. And in the very highest peak, they sold it there. Now, think about it. If they sold it there, and then we do have a market structure shift here, are they going to hold on to their short positions if they're naturally a hedger? Open interest is going to, by natural order of things, reduce as it's going lower because what are they doing? They're covering those short positions they built in here. That's what's happening. All through this process of going lower, open interest is declining. You don't get that taught in textbooks. It's showing you that they are, in fact, in a sell program and they're profit-taking. As it's going lower, 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 open interest is going to decline. Then we hit a level like this, major support. Are they going to want to hold on to a heavy net short position by offering liquidity to the buyers? No way. How do they upset that? They do rapid price declines. It knocks the desire for buyers to want to move away and get out of their way because they don't want to be a provider. And by, by providing the sell side to buyers, they don't want that risk. And that's why they do these massive sell-offs in price. You see these big moves that jump down to specific levels and they just keep going lower and lower and lower. They do that to take away and control sentiment on the, on the near term. You may have been bullish back here. Well, that goes away real quick when they do this, and they keep driving it lower. All of a sudden, there's no support levels until you get down to 7150. They know buyers are going to come in, so they have to reset and drop down quick. Boom, they reset. They take all their uh, interest on being a sell-side liquidity provider and drop it down to its lowest point. Why are they doing that? Because now their exposure is not here. Their exposure starts down here. And they go back to that same cycle. Now, everybody's starting to buy, 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 buy. And they will provide that liquidity because they've already profited down here from back here, back here, and back here. All in the last week of September, the midpoint of October, and the second week of November where they sold and built in their bearish positions. The telltale sign is inside that support level at 7150, dovetailing this with IPTA data ranges and quarterly shifts, we know that this is most likely going to occur and move Aussie dollar up and go back into the charts and go back into what I was talking about for Australian dollar. I told you that it was going to go higher. This is not hindsight cherry picking. I'm telling you why I said these things and what was behind the scenes that I can't go through. I mean, look how much we're talking about it now. If I did this kind of talk on everything and every setup every single day, I'd never get done. I'd never see my wife. <laughs> I'd probably be divorced really quick. But these are the things that you're going to do in your analysis. It won't take this long. Obviously, you'll, you'll know what you're looking for because of the teachings. But the mechanics behind it all is that 7150 is support. Price on the weekly charts bounced there before. We're in the low end of the, the range for the weekly, um, um, well, the lowest point, which has been in a long period of time, going back, go back to your weekly chart that I showed here in your notes, and you'll see that that's the lowest it's been in recent time in the weekly chart, so therefore it would be reasonable to expect to see some bounce at 7150. But I'm drawing your attention to that little area in December. That little massive, really, it's a massive decline in open interest. Right there. That purple line, when it tanked, went low real quick like that. That's the central bank getting rid of any of their remaining short position. So now they're, they're done. They completed their sell program. First week of November, mid part of December. So now the, they're ready. They're prepared for buyers to come in. They have reset themselves. There's no exposure on the upside. 
okay, against them by holding heavy, heavy shorts. So now they can start offering that liquidity from the low end because they made their book from 7750 all the way down to 7150. 600 pips. And believe me, they're moving size on all that. So at, from that point on, okay, we had that delineation on this candle or bar, remember, earlier. And looking back, 20 trading days would put you right about in here. That means the high is here. That's where they're going to run liquidity. That's where they're going to be seeking to take price. Now, what does this mean for Forex trading? All right, so this is what we've seen price do. Here's that 40-day cast forward day. That's the very day, and this is that down candle or down open high low close candle, that small little one. And then here's the, the last one or the 40-day look forward from the 1st of November. Price goes higher from there, creates a down candle. Price moves above that candle here. This becomes a bullish order block, so if price was to ever come back down, we could be a buyer there. I said we'd like to see some bullishness on this candle here because we're on the left side of the curve. This is all the sell side. Now, if they're going to be bullish, you're going to go look over here at every down candle. There should be some bullishness in here. We saw some of that. They have a down candle here. If we had a retracement, I would like to see it price come back down here. I would be a buyer. That was a potential scenario that could have unfolded. If it didn't and we blew out the high of this candle, this down candle is going to be the new bullish order block. So it's high, comes in at 73.50. Price comes down, hits it here yesterday, finds some sensitivity there, and expands up and closes in the range. The context of the move for Australian dollar was I was not bearish Australian dollar. I did not have you set up to expect lower prices on Australian dollar. We were looking for this thing to come up here and close in this range and potentially up into this bearish order block, and it's now confirmed that it wants to go higher relative to the things we just said based on that weekly chart and what we described on the futures contract on its own daily chart. We had a mean threshold of the range from this candle's open to this candle's close. That's what this range is here. We've moved through that. So now what is it indicating? It wants to go higher. What's it going to reach for? It's going to look for a clear run above this high here because that's where the buy stops are resting. They're not going to take it just to this level here and be satisfied. If they're going to allow this move to take place, they're going to punch it through equal highs. Now, I know you're saying if you're, if you're new and you haven't really uh, paid too much attention to equal highs and equal lows and you're only looking for like a perfect equal candle high, this is, in my opinion, this is an equal level. It's so close to, to, um, to one another in terms of proximity. If you look at the buys of the candle, they're almost the same. I mean, look at that. I mean, we have the open on this candle and the close on this candle. It's essentially the same thing. We only have this one little wick. So the liquidity really is above here. And in my opinion, it's going to go above this level here. So that puts us around that 75.70 to 75.80 level like we talked about relative to that weekly chart. So by taking this information and applying it to your charts, it helps you map out while you have areas where, yes, this could happen. We could trade down here, but if, we, if it did, we were buying. We would be expecting to be a buyer down there. It may not happen. They may allow price to keep on going and give you no real retracement, but you still had reference points to be watching and monitoring going forward. This was the new down candle. Okay, It's going to be a bullish order block, so therefore we should not see this candle give way if it trades through it. It did. It traded above its high. So now this has become the support level. This level is where the banks are going to look to defend it on the downside. So any movement into it, like we see here, this candle trades into the body and quickly rejects. The next day it opens, trades down, it hits the bodies. I'm sorry, the candle It's high. It's 73.55. goes a little bit below. Look at the low. 73.52. It only went three pips below the level we would be watching for. And then look at the aggressive move through it. Trading in, delivering price with a bullish side of price buy side delivery. We had all down movement here between 74.34 and 73.80. Price has moved. From 73.80 to 74.34 yesterday. So having that.
having that move from 7380 to 7434, it closed in that fair value gap that we've, we've been monitoring that occurred in December 2016, and then prices moved through the mean threshold. It's obvious that we'll see a move above that 7525 level. How much further? Like I said, 7580 looks likely, uh, and if we do that, we could really make a run all the way up into uh, seventy-six. I'd say seventy-six fifty. So seventy-six fifty is a likely upside objective if we get really rolling higher. But apart from that, uh, that that was the. Uh, the DNA or anatomy, if you will, of why the Australian dollar moved up, why we were expecting bullishness on it. Uh, behind the scenes, these higher time frame ideas that you're learning, you have to learn to trust them on these monthly, weekly, and daily and applying open interest to levels that you would expect to see bullishness in. Every three months, okay, and this is the last point, and then we're going to close today's teaching. The point at which these three month the four month moves that take place every quarter there's a major shift in market structure and while that may not undo the long term bullish or bearish moves they are executable in a way where you can make great deal of money you can take a lot of money out of positions if you're properly aligned if you are not aware of these they will take you by surprise and you're like where did this come from you know there's you know there's no worse feeling than expecting a move to go hard one direction and then see it do something like this. Like, for instance, if you were looking at uh, this move here and say you were uh, a Fibonacci trader, not necessarily optimal trade entry, but say you were a Fibonacci trader and you saw the 50 level here. And there's a guy on Baby Pips that makes a name for himself on trading at 50 level uh, fibs. And I, I use that as equilibrium. But you could be looking at that and say, okay, yeah, in this day, you would have probably felt good about the whole idea of being bearish on Australian dollar. Not by what we've been talking about. I mean, we, we mapped out very specific. We even talked about that very day being bullish. But in the retail mind, this whole day right here, that would look like, okay, well, we have a double top now. It's at a 50 level on the FIB. It's going to go down and trade down below here. Or I'll do, I'll do an ABCD type move, and I'll be looking for... 70s on the uh, Australian dollar. That's retail thinking. We were not thinking that at all. We're mapping that candle out as a reason to be a buyer. So the things you're learning is completely diametrically opposed to those things that you learn in the retail world. And it's like that because we have to capitalize on those ideas because those things permeate large fund trading. Where the buy stops, where the sell stops, it's the same way. Human nature is going to repeat itself. Every large fund trader starts as a low-end trader just like you are right now. Just like I started, grassroots, we all start from the same place, the beginning. No one becomes a large fund trader managing billions and millions of dollars because you just felt like you want to do it today. Try it. Try it today. If you're successful today, try to get a, a large fund trader's position by the end of the month. If you can do that, I'll send you $1 million through PayPal. <laughs> you have to do some things. you got to prove you, know, you can trade. Okay, and you have to go through a lot of uh, rickamarole, if you will, if my if I can quote my grandmother, to get to that that position. And you have to prove yourself. It doesn't happen by accident. So, if they are doing the very things they did as a regular trader, but they still have to do things with guidelines, okay, then it's common sense that their their stops are going to be right where everyone else is going to be placing their stops. But they have a lot more money at risk. They have exposure that you don't have. You're trading micro lots and mini lots and all these other things. And I'm not trying to disparage you or, 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 or you talk down to you because I started the same way. I started with small stuff, but they don't see you. You're not even a blip on the radar screen, but they do see these large pending orders above old highs and below old lows in the last 60 days, in the last 40 days, in the last 20 days. And then once you find a time marker where you can delineate when there's a shift that has taken place or when you cast forward 60 days at that moment you know in the future 60 days from that last market structure shift quarterly you know that that's a delineation in the in the future so you can already anticipate a significant move 20 days from that one back from it which would be not 
40 days, it would be 20 days back from that new market uh, delineation. So for what I'm saying is, is by having these things on your chart, you'll be able to look backwards and forwards and looking for the ranges, just like the IPTA algorithm will look for where the most recent 20-day, 40-day, and 60-day stops are. If they have been cleared out on both sides of the marketplace, once they have been wiped out and we're in equilibrium, you have to look at where the next range high and low is outside of the last 20, I'm sorry, last 60 days. That will tell you where the next big significant move is going to be. And if you combine that with weekly and monthly charts, it's almost like a no-brainer. You just have to wait for it to happen. It takes time for that to unfold. And most of us by human nature are not patient. We're impatient. Some of the folks that have left this mentorship are classic scenarios of that. They're just impatient. They want to know it right away. They wanted to learn it all in one month. You know, they stuck it out for the second month, the third month, the fourth month. It was too much. I can't wait for it. I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta just gotta toss it in. And they'll be they'll regret the rest of their life. Trust me, they're gonna regret it. When they look back, they're gonna feel like they've missed an opportunity of a lifetime and they have. What you're learning, you're not gonna get that from anywhere else, but it's gonna require you to work for it. I'm gonna put your nose right where you need to be focusing, but I cannot take away the lessons that by studying it will give you. That has to happen by you doing it. And if you can't be here in the live sessions, they're recorded. It's the same thing. There's nothing different by watching the recording. When we leave January's content, we're going to be applying all these things. So that way, when you start looking at me doing short-term trading and weekly one-shot, one-kill setups, and then we go deeper into the mentorship, when we start going back into intraday trading, you'll see all these things are the reasons why I'm being a buyer or a seller in London Open or a buyer and seller in New York session and why these levels I'm keying off of and telling you everything that you saw us doing in the September month where we were nailing it highs and lows what the market was doing almost daily all that was was me applying what I just showed you in this teaching I just didn't go through all the, the mechanics behind it all I just knew it and applied it and just talked about it just you know whatever this is what's going on and it gives you a great deal of confidence and for some of you it will create a uh, an air of arrogance don't let that become don't let it define you but you definitely will have a level of confidence that goes through the roof because you're going to know with a great deal of trust that the market is trying to get to a level for a real reason and it's being manipulated it's being controlled it's being driven there it has no other way of operating except for over time Price will agree on a level that's arrived at what IPTA is seeking. Last 60 days, where's the high and the low? Last 40 days, where's the high and the low? Last 20 days, where's the high and the low? That's where your liquidity pools are. Okay, last 20 days, where is the gaps? Where are the gaps in the last 40 days? Where is the gaps in the last 60 days? That's where all your fair value levels are. Think about it. What's, where's the consolidations in the last 20 days, the last 40 days, and the last 60 days? That's where your equilibrium price points are going to be. When the market isn't going to move, it's going to gravitate and hang at those levels. When you see me say, I'm not doing anything today, the market's going to be uh, sideways. And you're all like, well, how did you know that? This, what I just taught you today. How to use the data ranges tells, tells you what you should be doing. Should you be expecting range expansion on the upside? Should you be expecting range expansion on the downside? That is directional bias. That's are you bullish today or are you bearish today? If you are not in a range where it's going to expand and you're hanging around equilibrium in the last 20 days, the last 40 days, and the last 60 days, in other words, what's that look like? If you go back 60 days and you see where the price has made a small little trading range, divide that range in half. That's equilibrium. If your price right now today if is just hanging around and dollar index is not trying to move, it's probably going to be a Z day. That means it's going to go up a little bit, down a little bit, and hang around the middle of the range until it gets some kind of manipulation. What's going to cause that? High impact news, which is the reason why I started you in September looking at the high impact and medium impact news events for the week. Draw all those things together. Everything that you've been exposed to so far for the mentorship, draw all those things together and apply the IPTA data ranges now. 
that all of you are trying to overcomplicate it, and it's probably my fault because of the way I taught it. And believe me, it's a lot of things to digest. It's not simply 60, 40, and 20, and therefore everything unlocks. You have to use those ranges looking back and see where the highs and lows are, where the gaps are, where the fair value gaps are, where equilibrium is. And it'll tell you where the institutional reference points are. It's up to you to execute on them when they get to those levels based on what a weekly chart and daily chart is indicating, bullishness or bearishness. Just because it goes above an old high doesn't mean it's a sell. It could be a confirmation it's going to go to the next buy stop level above it. That's the next stage of January's content where we start building the ideas of, okay, using a monthly and the weekly and a daily chart, nothing less than that. What do we do? What do we look for? What's the process? What sets up the trades on these time frames? Because if we can identify and prove that this is what goes on in price, if it does these types of things that are repeating phenomenon, going back to our algorithm idea and computer program analogy, if IPTA knows simply by going back, what's today's date? Everybody knows what today's date is. It's January 12, 2017. It, the computer programmer can, ga can gather that information. Okay, so what's 60 days from that backwards in time? Okay, then the, al the algorithm will simply say, okay, what's the highest value of that asset that it traded to? Okay, right there. So now I need to go back up to that level. That's what it's going to do. It's going to go up there to allow the bank traders to position themselves. Once it gets close to that level, then the bank level and broker level interventions and manipulations can come in. But the, the, the broker is not going to jump your spread 50 to 100 pips. The central bank has to get it in close proximity to these levels. Then the lower level manipulation that takes place in broker level, that's when that happens. But your broker is not killing you and wiping you out with 50 pip swings. That doesn't happen. It has to allow price to be driven there, and that's all central bank level. So I threw a lot at you today, children. Uh, hopefully uh, I haven't confused any of you. Hopefully uh, I've given more clarity. Um, you're going to see examples of me actually using this information, um, but I have to give it to you conceptually first, so that way I won't be uh, – inundated with a million questions about why'd you put a line here why'd you uh, you'll know why I'm doing it because I when I explain it based on what I'm what I've talked about here and what I've shown in the uh, lesson 1.1 1, 1 .1 for January it'll it'll start making sense because we're not just going to do this one time and never come back to it we're going to be doing this throughout the mentorship and if you I'm not saying you should but when I start the signal service in the winter of 2017 um, you'll know why I'm dealing with certain signals then. If you if you're able to watch it, some of you will probably uh, want just to see what you know what I'm doing, just to see how it lines up with what you learn. But the uh, the signals are all going to be based on what you're you're seeing here, and it's why they're going to be so good. That's why September was so powerful. I had to show you that yes, we can read price. It's very predictable, and if it's that predictable on the short term, then it has to be that predictable in the higher time frame. And you see now that it can be. It's all time and price. Time and price. Time is date on the higher time frame. It's not time of day. It's date, calendar days. And they're calendar days that the markets trade. So if we know that there's a range of 20, 40, and 60 days that the algorithm will look back, then you know what high and low do you need to be focusing on. If market structure is bearish, what does that tell you? Where's the low in the last 20 days? Where's the low in the last 40 days? Where's the low in the last 60 days? That's where it's going to be reaching for. It's looking for that sell side liquidity below those lows. What happens if it has two lower lows that haven't been traded to? And it trades down below the one in the last 20 days, it takes that low out. And there's a lower low, 60 days in that range, 60 days back, there's a low. And you know that it's possibly going to go down there. But say it doesn't go down there, and it rejects, and it breaks market structure bullishly. What does that tell you? You have a quarterly shift. Now it's bullish. F start finding the highs in the last 20 days, the last 40 days, and the last 60 days. And you'll know what IPTA is doing. It's going to draw a price up to them. Everyone else is going to be looking at retail thinking, okay, this is a trend. It's downtrend. And they're going to look for that old low 60 days out, 
not because they're doing what we're doing, but they're going to see classic support resistance ideas. And they hold on to it. They marry the idea. It's been going down. It's been going down. So therefore, it must continuously keep going down. And they just watch the market grind against them. And all of a sudden, we see what we're seeing in the chart right now. Australian dollar. What happened? What happened? Look! Look at the forums just for fun today. What happened to the Australian dollar? I haven't been there yet, but I'm just prophesying. <laughs> They're probably saying, well, "What happened to the Australian dollar?" Well, you all know what's happened in the Australian dollar. We talked about this before the fact, why it's trading here, why it went there. And now you know the mechanics behind the scene. What, what led me to believe that this 74.34 was likely, that the mean threshold was uh, um, uh, upside objective, and why this currency is a leadership currency. Why did I focus on this one? Why, I, why was I talking about this one and not the New Zealand dollar? That's a study for you this week as well. Ha, share that with me on the forum. Show me what you discovered by contrasting the price action, just like we just did it here for Aussie dollar. Do the same thing with New Zealand. Do the same thing with Euro. Do it with the cable. You have to practice, folks. If you only do the things I'm only showing you, you're cheating yourself of all kinds of learning opportunity. The time that you have together Believe me, you want to maximize it. And I know some of you have businesses, some of you have family obligations, and this is a long-winded session, but, you know, we only have two of them a week, so suck it up. <laughs> the, uh, there's so much information. I, I, I literally have 20 years of information I'm trying to share with you. And it's a lot of information, but this information still has to be practiced. You have to implement it in your charts. You have to look for it. You have to see it in your charts. If you're not going to do that, this is going to be uh, – it's not going to be uh, enchanting for you to be here. You're, you're, if you're wanting me to tell you this is how it is, and it's always going to be this way, and it doesn't require you to look for it and study it, mm -mm, it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. But you do have to do a little bit of rolling up your sleeves, get your nose in the charts, but I promise you, this is a guarantee. If you do the things I'm telling you to do in this teaching and everything in this month of January – it will give you every possible scenario for any type of trader you want to be. And it will put you in the high odds category. You'll be in the upper 5%. You'll, you will most likely be on the right side and far less time be offside on your trade. And that's what the higher time frame whole, whole idea is about because you're trying to align yourself with smart money. Everyone that's on YouTube is teaching smart money. This is the market maker. I'm on a one-minute chart teaching this, by, by the way. They're not on a one-minute chart. They're not even down there. They don't, they don't even – they're not looking at that. They're looking at the orders on a daily chart. That's what they're looking at. That's what's driving price. And outside of that, it's a 15-minute time frame. They're looking for liquidity pools and, and, and ideas around a 15-minute time frame. Five-minute, again, they're not looking at that. But you can use a five-minute chart to find where there's a most likely uh, a small little gap that would not appear readily on a 15 or an hourly chart. So all these things dovetail nicely, but you won't appreciate that dovetailing until you start getting in there and spending some time looking at price. That's already happened. Some of you, a large group of you, are so worried about that right edge. Tell me what that right edge is telling you, Michael, when that won't make sense to you, and you'll leave the mentorship. If I just gave you trades every, every day, yeah, you'd make money. But when I'm done teaching, and, it's, and that's happening, I'm done. When I walk away, you've made money, but you didn't learn how to trade, and that's a waste of time and money. You want to be focusing on what's happened on that left side of that chart because if, once you understand all that, it's going to repeat itself because if, in fact, there is a smart money entity, and they are manipulating, and they are controlling things because they're motivated by money and greed, they're not going to change their MO. Their motive is going to be the same thing going forward. It's the same business model every single day it doesn't change it's not going to stop working the only thing is is if you share it with people number one you're just making it common knowledge and it just you just don't want to do it you don't want to do it not because it's going to stop working but because you just want to be a part of that small group that is profitable that is an elite that you know what you're doing with your money you're not gambling this is not gambling you're not rolling the dice. You're waiting for a scenario where those individuals that control price 
are in play, their moving price, and you're on the same side as them, by default you have no other way except for seeing positive res res results. Does that mean profitability? Maybe. If you're in a demo account, you can't make money on that. But you learn a positive response, and then therefore it teaches you, this worked. Let me try it again. Wow, this worked. Let me try it again. Why do you think I tell you guys that it takes a minimum of six months? Because if you look at the things I teach, you will see at least one market structure shift in that time period. You need to see one because once you understand when it happens and you see it unfolding, oh, man, the confidence level sends you through the roof. You're like, oh, man, I'm, I, I'm never doing this again. I'm never working for somebody else again. I'm going to learn this business, and I'm out of here. I'm, I'm done. I need to do this the rest of my life. And your passion level will go crazy. And you'll know what you're doing. You won't be just excited like a football game fan. You'll know what you're excited about and why it's exciting because it's consistent. It's over and over, reoccurring. It's never deviating. It's there all the time. Very rarely do you hear these terms taught and spoke about in textbooks. You know, uh, there's always a risk. There's always this and there's always that. The risk is you reading it wrong, but this is always there in price. The problem is, is that you're going to let you as the trader steer you wrong. Because you're going to look at something, you're going to get so opinionated about something. Higher time frame, it's hard to change directions a lot on that daily and weekly chart. It's, it's usually one direction for a while. That's why you have to start there. Because if you start on a lower time frame, you're changing your mind 20 times inside of the day. I mean, I talk to some people outside of our group that are still in a free membership area that just go on my tutorials and follow my YouTube channel. They send me charts all day long. I can't get to them. I can't, get to, I can't keep up with the uh, emails coming in. But they send me their changed mind. You know, here's, the, here's what I'm doing today in, in cable. I'm buying this. And then, okay, here's 20 minutes later. They, okay, I, I changed my mind. I'm selling it. And they change their mind again. This is all happening in two hours. That's somebody that has no idea what's going on. No idea what's going on. By having the higher time frame premise, by looking at monthly, weekly, and daily charts, Focusing on the daily chart, this is what we're doing with a daily chart. We're framing it like a bank does. No one's teaching you this. They don't give you the perspective, okay, from an institutional vantage point where how and why they're going to go to a specific higher low. Yes, you can go back in time and look at a chart and say, okay, here's an old low. There's going to be sell side liquidity here or sell stops here. There are all kinds of people on YouTube that are doing that now. And, yeah, it's great. But I'm telling you which low and which high to go to. There's a specific phenomenon that repeats itself over and over and over again. And by having that as your routine, every day you sit down with your daily chart and say, okay, where are we at in the current range? Where are we at with uh, respect to the lowest low and the highest high in the last 20 days, the last 60 days, and the last, I'm sorry, the last 20, 40, and 60 days? Have we cleared both sides of the board? Have we taken all the buy stops in the last 60 days, in the most highest high, have we rejected all that and cleared out and back in the middle of the range? Because what does that mean? You have to study, are we at a lar larger, longer-term equilibrium where we could stay sideways for a while, or now are we going to the sell side, looking for the lows outside the last 60 days range? By having that and then start implementing inter-market analysis, that means you're going to start having ideas from the commodity market, the equities market bonds, all those things will start giving you more information, and then it'll tell you where the opportunities really are. That way, even though we can be specific and specialist about, I'm a euro trader, I'm a, I'm a crude oil trader, I'm a gold trader, you do want to have some diversity by having some exposure in other asset classes because it gives you a great deal of context about why you think your market's going to go up or down or doesn't move at all. Uh, Canadian dollar is a uh, good example. If, if the crude oil market's um, you know, acting and behaving a certain way, the Canadian dollar is going to have a, a direct uh, response to that. And when crude oil is not an, uh, of any effect, you know, Canadian dollar you know, will move just like the other currencies will. But crude oil has a great deal of influence over that particular uh, currency, Canadian dollar. Having intermarket analysis and relative strength analysis together and applying SMT studies like the dollar index and the interest rate stuff that I'm teaching you this month, 
you'll have very, very little opinions about what the higher time frames are telling you. And when you do that, you are in line with what the institutions are doing because you're not changing your mind every day. This is what's going to do. I don't care if I see two down days on a, on a daily chart. Nothing's changed. It just means it's retracing. They're coming back for some more orders to buy more. And that's when we go into discussions about building in larger positions with an underlying bullish move that's already there. We've already put in a position that's bullish. We're retracing. How do you add more to that? Where do you add more to it? And how do you protect that position as well? And, and what, what, are, what do you do to scale out? Do we ever hold for whole, full positions? Yeah. But you need to know all these things you know, by the end of this, this month to fully appreciate what we start teaching in February, March, and April because they're going to repeat themselves. And as long as you have a general idea of what is being taught in January, I mean, if you're completely lost, then obviously you're going to need to reach out to me after the last lesson of January. But for the most part, if you have a general idea of what I'm talking about, when we start applying it every single day we sit down, you'll see the, the data points I'm looking at. You'll know exactly why I'm calling this high being significant or this low being significant or this gap. You know, that, that will make perfect sense to you then. What order block am I looking at? Why? Why this order block and that, not that one, Michael? Why'd you pick this swing high, Michael, and not that swing high, Michael? You just learned it today. There's a range I'm looking for. It's 20 days back, 40 days back, 60 days back. Then I'm casting forward, and I know from that point on, I know I can have a new look back point where I can go 20 days, 40 days, 60 days back, and wait for those new highs and lows to form that have not made its way into price yet. When they form, liquidity will build above it or below it. Based on what I see on the higher time frame, I know what side the market's going to reach for. When you do that same thing, you're not going to send me emails and text messages and direct messages. Um, do you think that um, Australian dollar is going to go down today? I, I think that uh, Canadian dollar is going to go down today. What do you think? Don't ask me what I think. If you're watching my videos and you're in here, don't ask me what I think. The whole point is, is learn from what I'm teaching you, and you arrive at your own opinion. And then when you're wrong, what did you, what did you do wrong? Don't avoid that. That's a learning opportunity. Take that as a big opportunity center stage. Make me a better trader. What can I do? What did I, what did I do wrong, and what did I see wrong there so I don't repeat that same thing? That's the benefit of being in here. You need to go through the lab experience. Go through the exercise. Okay, and make the mistakes now. You want to do those things right now when it won't hurt you. It won't hurt your development. It won't hurt your money. It won't take anything from you. It will build you up. The folks that have left us, they have, they have no concept of that. They don't, want, they don't want to wait around. They don't want to learn anything. They want to be spoon-fed. You are here to learn how to do what I do. Analyze the markets. Call the markets from where they are right now and where they're going to be at next. In between those two price points, there's opportunities, and I'm going to teach you how to take those opportunities and manifest that in the form of trades, keeping risk low, equity curves going higher, and managing risk all throughout the whole process. But you cannot get to that level without some interaction on your part, and it may require you to do things by watching videos like this is a live session. You may be forced to do these things by studying the recordings. Do not think that this is not of any value because it's a recording. It has no, it has no basis on it. That has no effect on it. Staying committed to the development process is hard. It's very, very hard. But I'm trusting that what I'm showing you here proves, number one, there is a real routine on how why price goes to a specific level why it repeats, why I tell you that it's not going to stop working, why I tell you there's absolutely an algorithm that controls price because it does things that a computer program would naturally do. Because I learned to be a computer programmer. I went to school. I have a degree in computer science specializing in information systems. I know computer programming. I know it. So if I look at this stuff, and I wanted to become a systems analyst when I was going to school. That was my job. I wanted to build the documentation stage so I can sit down with the programmers and go through them and if they had issues with the coding I would help them you know make this uh, uh, this process work but I wasn't going to be the coder I, I don't have the patience to do the coding but 
when I started learning the mechanics of what their what the uh, price delivery does, I didn't think about it. It just jumped on my head. This is a computer program. This could be automated. And by curiosity, I went home and looked in the charts and said, okay, if this is possible, I should see it in, in price. And here you go. It was right there. And I got nervous and excited at the same time. I was laughing and crying at the same time because I thought I literally hit the lottery. Like I had the winning lottery numbers for the lotto every week going forward. I had it. Every tumbler clicked. It made perfect sense. I knew right away why I was wrong on everything I lost money on. And I knew now going forward, where's the next setup going to be? Why do I have to wait for it? And when would it, what, what, how much time will it take for it to happen? When is it most likely to occur? Where is that signal going to format before it even gets to that price level? That's what this gives you. It gives you every bit of clarity that you don't have right now. Once you understand what you're doing with it, you'll have every bit of understanding about why you're waiting and sitting on your hands. See, some of you say, oh, there's no setup right now. Oh, Michael, I don't want to hear that. Because I want you to focus on what's going on. The price has to be driven to a specific level. Then I can tell you why this is what happened. We said it was going up. We told you the level was going to go up. But why did it go there? You learned that today. Going forward, you want to be using these tools to be able to frame the ideas that lead to a trade setup. As you go through more of the material, small little pieces will start coming clear. Things that you have questions right now, you need to not send them to me in an email. Be surprised by finding the answers in the future lessons and in your own study. That's how you practice. That's how you develop as a trader. Me giving you an answer isn't going to always satisfy because you're going to still come with 50 more questions. I know that because it's the same thing I encountered. When I think I need to know something about something and I scoured the Internet for it, it created 50 more questions. Well, wait a minute now. If I came in with one one little thing that I was unsure about, I go in, I start looking for it, and I get the response and the answer to that. But then it created 20,000 different scenarios that would create a what-if scenario. Well, what if this and what if that? And that's the problem. Every one of you are in that stage, and it's because you're overzealous. And I, I appreciate that. Believe me, I've been there. But you also have to just take a little bit of faith and trust the fact that I've taught this before. You are not a guinea pig scenario. I've done this with groups of people and individual basis as well. Trust me, I will get you where you want to be at, but you have to allow it to happen. But you also have to be a part of it by practicing and looking for it. Not looking for trades, looking for the things that I'm telling you, the evidence that there is control. If they evidence control in price, that means that there's no reason for you not to trust the things I'm telling you in the future. If there's something I'm going to teach you in the future, I say, okay, refer to the IPTA data ranges. This is why this turtle soup false break below or low is going to happen, and we can be a buyer down here. Because if I start saying, okay, look, uh, we're going to buy tomorrow's uh, – tomorrow we're going to buy today's low. Oh, I don't know about that. Because if we sit in London and it starts diving 50 pips all in one candle, I guarantee you 85% or more not buying that day. You're not buying that low. You're going to wait for a bullish order block or an optimal trade entry, or you're going to wait for it to move up 60 pips before you think it's going to go up. You won't trust it, and you've missed the whole learning experience. You've got to go through the things I'm putting you in front of to do those very things. Pay attention to what's being done right now. I'm getting a 1,000 questions about why they can't get to October content right now. Oh, I can't watch the things in October. I can't, I can't look at what's going on in November. Why are you there? That stuff's there forever. You have access to that. Focus right now on what's being taught in January. I'm telling you, it's a lot of stuff. And if you are wasting your time on things that's already been taught to you and it's already in recording, you can go watch it any other time. Pay attention more than any other month closely to this one. Because I guarantee you, if there's any month you're going to have to come back to and study, it's this one. There's so much stuff in it. It's dense. It's very, very vast. You have no Easy way through this. You've got to grind through a lot of this material, and you're going to have to refer back to it many times. 
And believe me, you'll be back through this whole month's content multiple times, even when you complete the mentorship. And you're going to find stuff that you didn't get the first time, the 20th time, the 30th time. It's a lot of information. It's two decades worth of stuff. You want to be a big, uh, big time trader? You want to be consistently profitable? It's in this month. You want to know when not to trade and lose money? It's in this month. You want to know how to frame a trade before price ever gets there? It's in this month. You want to be a day trader? It's in this month. Short-term trader? This month, too. You want to be a swing trader? Here. You want to be an options trader? It's here. You want, be, you want to be a trend trader? You want to be a breakout artist? You want to be a trader that sells options, writes options? It's in here. You won't appreciate it until we get to the supplementary teachings, but everything that leads to you being effective doing those other things stems from what you understand in being taught in January. Here, all the content is being delivered. It's going to be a lot more than eight lessons, folks. It's more. It's sub-teachings inside of these major eight topics. Lots of it. And that's the reason why we're not doing these live sessions. And I'm throwing an extra one in here today by time because I want to encourage you that what you're waiting for is exactly what you're looking for. And believe me, it's a lot of stuff, and you're probably going to, your head's going to hurt. You're going to, have, you're going to feel like, man, this is information overload. And I'm already pre-warning you. This month, and I told you this of all the other months in this mentorship, this is the one. It's a monster. It's tons of stuff, and you're going to have to study. You're going to have to study. In February, we'll resume back to a very standardized teaching model, eight lessons, supportive uh, in, in nature, and we'll be back to doing more live sessions you know, throughout the week. And then in March, we'll be obviously in live session on a daily basis. Every Monday through Friday, we'll be back in live session. But you've got to give me the time to give you this information and still operate as the mentor and answering emails and also running it too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I have, and I have a family. So permitting me the time to build the lessons for you and change some of the things, because all my notes are all based on like commodities and uh, indices. So I have to change some things and create some slides that relate to foreign exchange because I'm predominantly teaching to a crowd that's come to me by way of FX. But as, when it's um, when it's necessary, you'll hear me talk about it where um, this is unique to a specific asset class. You know, like we talked about today with commodities, the idea of having the open interest in, in, in your study, that is only going to come by way of looking at the futures market. So since we're Forex traders, it, it is important that you avail yourself that information that's available to everyone. It's common knowledge. It's free. You can go on the internet and get it. Okay. And it's valuable. It's a gold mine. And people that think they understand it, while they may have a little bit, a myopic view of, of what one facet of it does for you, what you learned today was the real mechanics of what open interest does. It gives you the x-ray view of what the real smart money activity is. Are they really buying? Because if they're really buying, they're going to dump open interest, and it's going to drop 15% or more. And it's going to happen at a key support level. If it's going to sell off and start going lower, and if that was a real turtle soup sell, then that means prior to that turtle soup sell, there should have been a massive increase over time with that open interest going up. And you saw that in Australian dollar. Because open interest, high open interest, indicates them offering the sell side. They're only going to take part of that if they know eventually they're going to be able to sell that position off with price being going lower. That's the only time open interest is going to go up. And they can do this on long-term trends, but it will shift every quarter. They have to fund themselves for allowing the holding of that risk. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, well, Michael, if they're in control of price, what real, what real risk is there? Well, what happens when a rogue nation nukes another nation? You're not thinking that, are you? But that can happen. What would that do? What would that do if a nuclear bomb gets dropped in any nation? It's going to freak everybody out. Uh-oh, we're in World War III. Bombs are dropping. When September 11th happened, boom, the markets are all over the place. Anything can happen. Look at the Brexit. Look at Donald Trump. <laughs> Look what that did. There's risk, okay? But they take these risky in, uh, opportunities and they manipulate. 
but they don't want to hold on to something and not make money. So yeah, while they will provide liquidity and sell to the buyers that see price trade higher for a period of time, every three months, look at your charts and see if they don't reset themselves. Every three months, it's there. It happens in S&P. It happens in stocks. It happens in commodities. It happens in bonds. It happens in Forex. It's there every three to four months. You'll see it. It's there. And that's how they pay themselves for holding on to that risk, offering the liquidity for the sell side of it, providing the means for buyers to buy currency. They will do what we're discussing here, quarterly shifts. And you'll see evidence of that in open interest. It will happen at points at which, by looking back 20, 40, and 60 days, where those highs and lows are, where those gaps are, where equilibrium is, those reference points in that time field, okay, of 60 days is a maximum, look back. It's simple. And here's another study to make it easy for you. Just go back 60 days from every month beginning. Start every month. It was an exercise. Every single month, a calendar month, put, put a vertical line on at every new month. Go back 60 days, find the highest high and the lowest low, and you see if they don't wipe that out. You can take any pair. You can be the dollar index. It could be the, well, look at the Australian dollar. Put a vertical line on every single first trading day of every month, okay? Don't do them all at one time so that way your chart's nice and crisp and clean. But put a vertical line at the beginning of every month, the first trading day of every month, okay, and draw out a line Okay, 60 days, 60 trading days, okay, and then delineate that. And then find the highest high and the lowest low. And then go forward from the, from the to the right of that, and you see if they don't run those uh, buy stops and sell stops above, above that. And do the same thing for 40 days. And do the same thing for 20 days. Doing that study, that's exactly what I did the night that I seen how this works. That's all I did. I said, okay... If I'm a data, if I'm a computer programmer, I need to be able to reference something. How can they know what the orders are? Like, how? Because in my mind, uh, how could they see Lind Waldock's orders? Because that's how I looked at it. My my perspective was, if what I'm learning to do in the marketplace, to be a market maker, I have to know certain things. And what I was learning, if this is true then I should see evidences of it in price. And I couldn't wait to get home. I went home, pulled out my charts, and it was a Swiss franc chart. That was the, that was the actual chart. I opened up my uh, commodity price charts from uh, Commodity Trend Service, and I literally turned the page, and I literally, in seconds, seen it. I said, okay, if I'm a, if I'm a computer program and I'm going to be able to reach up into an area of orders, I can't, I can't know what every brokerage firm's orders are. There's no way. It's dynamic. Think about it. You might have a trade on right now, and you might have a stop on. It may be there, but something might change, and you collapse that trade. Your order's not there anymore. Every one of us are dynamic thinking. We may have an order there. Think about what you did with your last trade. How many times did you move your stop loss? <laughs> Think about it. You were long. You you moved your trade. You trailed your stop loss up. Okay. And then you start seeing a little trade and You're like, oh, let me move, let me move that back. And some of you probably moved it back further than it first originated at. You're dynamic. So your orders are always moving around. And that's why I say, okay, this is too much of a variable. There's no way for them to know every single book that's out there. So how can you standardize it? The epiphany I had was go back and go back the same number of days that I'm being taught to look for and just look for the high and the low. That's where the buy stops are and that's where the sell stops are. And there it was. It was like Solomon's mind just opened up. All the, the Fort Knox opened up. Everything happened that moment. A flood of emotions, flood of euphoria and fear. Like Oh, no, did I just do something I wasn't supposed to do? Did I just learn something and see something I wasn't supposed to? That's how I felt. I had this big old textbook, okay, of information I had to digest, and I literally didn't want to touch it anymore because in my mind, I had already cracked it. I didn't want to go back. 
I did not want to sit with these people and learn anything more than I had already learned there. I went from that to the corn market and commodities. It was there. Soybeans, live cattle, pork bellies, they don't trade anymore, silver, all the metals, palladium, platinum, high-grade copper, cotton, lumber, orange juice, it's all there. It's all there. Once you see it, you're never going to forget it, and you can't unsee it. And when you see these things that repeat over and over again, and they are, they're finite, you'll prove it to yourself in a, in a short little exercise like that. Pull up a chart. I don't care what asset class it is. Define it. Look back the last 20 days, last 40 days, and last 60 days. Where's the high and the low? Where's the liquidity voids? Where's the fair value, fair value gaps? And where's the equilibrium? And you'll know exactly what price is going to do on that right-hand side of your chart. It's going to move to those levels. Now, think in terms of overbought and oversold. You will be able to define a range by doing that. You don't need an indicator to tell you if you're bought, overbought or oversold. Look at the highest level of liquidity in the form of a high in the last 60 days and the lowest low in the last 60 days. That's your real overbought and oversold. You don't need, a, you don't need an indicator for that. I've made fun of that stuff in my free tutorials and on, on YouTube. You know, all these guys talking about divergence. I don't need a divergence. I need to know where's the range. Where am I in terms of institutional order flow? The real institutional order flow, the one I'm talking about, you don't hear this taught. Chris Laurie's not teaching this stuff, okay? Online trading isn't teaching it. YouTube guys on there, they're not teaching this. These are finite things that unless you came from where I came from, you're not seeing or learning or even knowing about this stuff. It gets deeper than this. It gets more specific than this. This was just the beginning stages of what I, I'm taking you, whether you realize it or not, I'm taking you through the whole process of how I became ICT. The things I learned, the way I learned it, the, the, the process of how I got to it, it's what you're seeing here. One stage at a time. And how do I know it's like this? Because I journal. I've kept a journal for years. And I remember certain things because I journal. I go back in time and look at certain things, and I get to relive that moment. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching you. Even before I started charging, look how passionate I've always been. I've always been passionate because I know what it was like for me to experience it, to go through the process in that euphoric moment when I finally got to what you're all aspiring to be, knowledgeable, knowing exactly what you're going to do with these candles on your chart. What's this telling you? What are you going to do with this information? I'm making money with this. I'm building a business. I'm building a future for my family. I'm building a means of being able to build a legacy for my family that they never have to be subordinate to an employer. You're going to make your own way with this information. And I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about that. And when you do these things and you go through the processes of the things I'm telling you to do with this month's content, doing these exercises, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's going to blow your mind. You're already here. It's not a sales pitch. I don't need to sell anything to you. You're seeing it. But you're not really seeing it yet. You haven't done that yet. When you do, as soon as you do it, I'm telling you, the forum's going to light up. You're going to be all, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to be throwing up charts on. Hey, look at this. It did it here. It did it here. This is it. then then you are not going to be able to sleep. It's going to be like no dose. Forget about it. Caffeine. You won't need it. You're going to be jumping around, hopped up on goofballs because you literally won't be able to contain yourself because you know exactly what you're looking for going forward. That's exactly what traders want. You're asking for setups. Give me signals. No, that's not what you want. Really break it down. You want to know what I know. You want to know when you are going to take a trade. Because think about it, That's ultimate control. Because if you know where to find the next 20, 30, 50, 60 trading opportunities, you don't have to trade today, do you? Contrast it to what you felt like this morning before the session opened, opened up. You're hoping I'll give you something right now because you want to take a trade. And that only comes because you don't know anything right now. You don't know what you want to do. You want to focus on the common goal is that this information is going to take you to the understanding of knowing what it is that you are going to do and when you don't want to do it. 
to stop distracting yourself by going through old content. Don't even watch my free tutorials this month. Just focus on this, because believe me, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. Then and only then, start amplifying it you know, by doing the other stuff and the new things that we teach in February going forward. But there's a lot of things that you need to be paying attention to for this month. If you miss this, you're going to struggle the rest of the mentorship. And I mean that. And if you don't stay, it's because you didn't take my words to heart right now. Because you don't, you're not, you're not trying to do it. And guess what? There's no shame in that. Because if you don't want to do the work what's required here, you're not going to make it in trading regardless if you had everything I was going to teach in this whole entire uh, mentorship. It's all between your ears that's going to be the problem. So this is the dividing marker for many of you. If you can't submit to what's required and th that you have to do in January, you might just hang it up. Just, you know, forget about it. Don't even worry about it. And, you know, go back to watching free tutorials and YouTube videos and, and then be content with that. And don't let it beat you up because you have now arrived at that's the final decision maker. Because if you're not going to be organized, if you're not going to be disciplined to do the work that's necessary, you're never going to trade. Not in fine profitability. It won't happen. That's not going to happen. You want reality. You want truth. That's what this is. You won't make money at all unless you submit and do the things I'm going to teach you in January. Everything. If you don't do these things with 1,000% assurity, you're wasting your time with me, you're wasting your money with me, and you're never going to be profitable with the things that I teach. It's not going to happen. You'll have hit and miss results, and you're going to undo everything because you're going to just go nuts. You're going to just overtrade, trying to get it all back, and you don't need to do any of those types of things. You can be very boring about it, and that's what you want. You want to be boring. You want, you want that same feeling you, when you go to work. It's the same thing every day, same people every day. That's what you want your trading to be, same thing. I know in 60 days, looking back, that's where I need to be focusing on. Last 40 days, where I, that's what I need to be focusing on. Last 20 days, that's what I need to be focusing on. Take that information, cast it forward. Those levels cast it forward. They're going to be influential in the future, and there's going to be new levels that create highs and lows 20 days going forward, 40 days going forward, 60 days going forward. And by doing that, you get a future level to draw a vertical line on and look back 20, 40, and 60 days. And if you get an overlap, that's when the magic happens. And with that, kids, I'm going to close it. Wish you a very good day. And I will have the recording up as soon as I'm humanly possible can. Um, I guess I do have to do another session. So this one might have to go on a little bit later because I do want to do a, a live recap. Not a live recap, but a, uh, a recap of today's price action. And then I'll have this one up afterwards. So because uh, it takes a little bit more time for this longer ones to compress. and uh, Hopefully you guys found it insightful. I'm going to wish you all a very good day, and good luck and good trading.